All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on Twitch. No engine, no libraries, just us. Uh, and right now we're working on multi-threading, which we just introduced over the past two days. And today we're actually at the part where we get to actually do some cool stuff with it, because uh, we had to cover all the basics uh, Monday and Tuesday. But now the basics are out of the way. So, yesterday we wrote what is essentially an a completely unsafe version of a work queue that we would like to get working. And so today what we're going to do is use sort of the stuff that we explained yet, um, on Monday and Tuesday uh, to show how we can make that more robust and make it so that it actually works properly with multi-threading instead of not working properly with multi-threading, which as I demonstrated yesterday, the naive code won't uh, do. So uh, before I get started, if you do want to follow along today, since we are going to be doing some coding here, uh, day 124. So what you want to do is if you pre-ordered the game, unpack day 123 source code and start with that. That is what I am starting with. Uh, so you'll be right where I am today. So let's jump right into it. Um, in the Win32 code, right, we've got our create thread here. Oops, create thread. And if you remember where we left off yesterday, what we did is we had a little work queue, uh, essentially kind of a little thing that we could do. We could push little strings in there and then we had worker threads that were supposed to uh, come along and pick up whatever was in that queue and do it, right? So it was supposed to pick up those strings that we were pushing in there, it was supposed to print them out uh, to the debug port. And we wrote this, uh, I wrote it essentially in a way that doesn't use any of the stuff that I talked about on Monday and Tuesday so that I could show you uh, what would happen if you didn't pay attention to the things that I said uh, we would need to pay attention to. Uh, and what we can see if we actually run that uh, is we get sort of bad things start to happen and they can kind of happen randomly. Uh, you can sort of see here we've got uh, two different threads, both uh, do work unit zero, for example. Um, and in fact, in this case, no thread did work unit two, it looks like. Um, you, can, you can sort of see that there's just very bad things happening here because what we would like to see is we don't really care which threads do which work units, but we want to see uh, all of the work units done and we want to see all of the work units done exactly one time. That is sort of the, the very minimal criteria that one might want to have for a work queue to say the very least. Okay, so let's take a look at why that's happening. Uh, I put the to do's in so I talked about it uh, yesterday but let's take a look at these in order so we can make sure that we actually have them uh, structured in a way that will make sure that we don't have these problems. All right, so the first problem that we have uh, is actually a problem uh, that, that doesn't really exist on the x64 processor, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's actually strictly a compiler problem, uh, but either way, it is still a problem. And so I wanna start talking about that now. Basically what we have here is in our push string, uh, what I talked about yesterday, the fact that the writes are not in order, you can see that right here what we do is we want to put something on our work queue. So we have the code that actually writes it into the queue, into the data part of the queue. But then the thing that increments this entry count here, right, the thing that actually says, oh, there's a new entry in the work queue, that thing is happening, right? It's happening at a time before we have actually written uh, the, the stuff into, uh, into, the, into the queue. What that means is, anyone who's looking for stuff on the queue might see this value get incremented before we have a chance to write it because we increment it and then write it, right? So what we would need to do uh, in order to make sure that this is more robust is first we would need to make sure that we were going to write the thing in before we do anything else. And then we could come in here and we could uh, go ahead and write the, the entry count, make that incremented. But, uh, even though I have rearranged these lines of code, this is still not okay. And the reason that it's not okay is because although the processor, again, this is why I say I, I seem to remember this being true about x64. Although I seem to recall the processor actually enforcing memory write order, which was a thing that was like not true on the PowerPC, but was true about x64, um, if I remember correctly, this is what I was saying, like it's been a while. Even though the processor might guarantee that if it sees writes in an, in an order in instructions, 
uh, that they will go out in order. You have to remember that the compiler is under no obligation to keep our writes in order. So at any time, an optimizing compiler could come in here and decide to move this incrementing of entry count up above where it sets the string because it just finds that to be a more efficient ordering for the instructions or for whatever reason. It doesn't even need a reason. It could just do it that way. This code would then be broken before it ever even got to the processor. And so at that point, it doesn't even matter if the processor has uh, strong ordering of writes. Uh, in, so, you, you know, you're, you're sort of, um, your, your code is broken before it even hits the processor. So it doesn't matter what the processor actually guarantees in terms of uh, the ordering of writes, right? And when I say ordering of writes on the processor, what I mean is not all processors guarantee that writes that come in in a certain order go out in a certain order, right? Uh, there's there's um, certainly uh, processors that can do their writes out of, out of order, out of the order in which they come in. And so that's worth being aware of because on any given platform, you kind of need to know that, right? So let's talk about how to solve both of those problems, even though, like I said, on x64, I don't think we actually need to solve it. Let's talk about how to solve it anyway. So the first thing we need to do in here is we need to put in something that will tell the compiler never to move a write that comes after a particular point before a write that came before this point, right? So basically what we need to do here is we need to do something that says like complete uh, past writes before future writes, right? We need to do something like this, okay? Uh, and what we want to do presumably, right, is we want to basically have this be some kind of a macro that on whatever platform we happen to be on, we can tweak it so that A, it will put in the correct thing for the compiler, right? which on this platform, there's gonna be a reason why it turns out we actually don't have to because we're gonna change a little something else, but we'll keep that, save that for a second. Uh, but what we can also do is in that macro, if we are on a platform that does not uh, support uh, strong ordering of writes, we can put in whatever instructions we need to put in there uh, because there's usually, a, there's things called memory fences uh, on processors which, which allow you to sort of explicitly tell the processor, hey, I need you to serialize these things, right? And we will get to one of those in a second because x64 does have some other things we might care about. All right. Uh, so basically what we want to do here is, is make sure that we have a thing which does this, right? And actually for the compiler, the only thing we actually need to tell it, um, I believe they've got these now in, in x64 Visual Studio, uh, they actually have um, these more explicitly than they used to be. Uh, let me just go ahead and look it up here. Uh, here it is. There we go. Uh, so basically what these things are, uh, these intrinsics, right? <clears throat> these Are these the old ones? Why is it telling me caution? Are all deprecated. All right, great. You should see how old I am. The things that I normally use are now deprecated. And they want me to use atomic thread fence and standard atomic. I don't want to use these C++ features. I don't want to use these C++ features at all. I do not trust C++. I am still going to use these, but you can follow this cautionary note if you would like to, right? Um, so what I would like to do is I would like to use these. Uh, what I want to do here is a write barrier. I want to be able to say, hey, I would like um, to make sure uh, that essentially this thing, the reason it's called a barrier, this thing, this line, uh, prevents any writes that were below it from being moved above it, right? That's what, that's what I would like to do. Uh, and so let me go ahead and see if that will actually work. I think it should. There we go. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And similarly, as you could see there, you could, uh, there was also a version of those uh, for reads, right? You could see it here. It was read barrier, right? So that would prevent reads from going through. And you can see, um, well, actually, I don't know if they actually say much here. Here you go. The write barrier intrinsic limits the compiler procedures that can remove or reorder memory access operations across the point of the call, right? So basically, at the point where you do it, right, it will prevent the writes from moving across this boundary uh, in ways that would, would make things problematic. Now, it's not actually a call, right? It doesn't actually do anything. This isn't actually a function call. It's just a marker that the compiler uses to know that it shouldn't do that, okay? So that's what I wanna do there. Now, like I said, on x64, 
And we'll double check this uh, later, or someone on the stream, if they, if they happen to know, can double check it. But on x64, I don't believe we actually ever need uh, to tell the CPU to enforce write, write ordering, because I believe it, it retires writes in order normally anyway. But if we did have to do that, uh, we would put in a memory fence. Um, let me see here. M fence. Uh, where is the uh, where is the memory fence? Um, wait on loads and stores. That is not what I was expecting to see. We would put in a memory fence here, and we might actually do that in a little bit here when we get to reads. There should be an intrinsic for this, and I forget what it is at the moment. Uh, but there is normally a memory fence. M fence intrinsic. Oops, in. Intrinsic. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Fence. Oops. Um, C plus plus a compiler equivalent. Underscore underscore m fence. There we go. I'm feeling slow today. I didn't get enough sleep last night, basically. I feel like we should have this. This should be here. Why are, why are we not getting, why, why is my M fence not showing up? This is one of the problems when you build your own libraries and stuff. You, like, I have long forgotten what the actual mem barriers uh, stuff is for x64. So I have to like reread it again uh, for the first time, and I'm just like, I just want the thing that tells the processor uh, not to reorder across here, uh, and I wanted to be able to memory fence it, but uh, for some reason, it doesn't seem to actually be showing up as a thing, uh, which I don't totally understand why. Let's take a look here. Well, you know what I'm going to do, just because, you know, I can. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go in here to program files, and I'm going to look to see. Uh, I want to see Visual Studio, there it is, Visual Studio 12, there we go. I want to look in VC include, uh, and I just want to see, is Intrin in here? Yeah. So I just want to see, where are my fence at? You know, where, where are the fences? So it is underscore underscore M fence, there it is in EMM Intrin. Uh, and there's, uh, I assume that's the load fence there, and there's the store fence. So it looks like you've got all the fences, underscore, underscore, mm uh, fence, so there you go. All right, so we've got those. So if we did want to actually do that, uh, S fence, I believe, would be the guy. Um, where is he? S fence, which is the processor fence for stores. Um, but like I said, I think in this particular case, I don't actually think we would need to do that. Uh, and so I'll go double check uh, that for now, but it would look like this, right? So if we, if we wanted to actually insert a processor barrier as well as a compiler barrier, uh, we can do that uh, by, by putting in uh, an, actual, an actual fence in, um, into the instruction stream, right? So what that does, this is strictly telling the compiler not to reorder stores. Um, around that bit, that uh, that point, and this is actually inserting an actual thing into the instruction stream that the processor will see, that says I don't want you to reorder stores around this point. Um, so anyway, so we'll check that that out in a bit. In fact, I'll just put a to do in here to do uh, double check the right ordering uh, stuff on. Uh, the CPU because I'm pretty sure that you don't that this is not what this is like I'm pretty sure that S fence is like a different thing, but you know point point being um, We'll leave that anyway <clears throat> So uh, Where do we go from here assuming that we actually have this right we still have another problem uh, that we haven't addressed yet which is the compiler, you know, now that we put this in there, the compiler actually knows this write barrier thing. But as you know, I said, we may not even really have to do that because this other thing I'm about to talk about in a second. And I'm sorry, there are so many crazy things to talk about. This is just, 
yeah, like I said, C wasn't made with multi-threading in mind, so you got all these kind of weird things to talk about. All right. So, what actually happens here, uh, and I, I mentioned this, uh, I believe, yesterday when we were writing this, is that the other threads here, right, when the compiler's looking at, uh, at how to compile this code, it may look at entry count and go, oh, you know what, nobody modifies entry count in here. So I, why do I ever need to even do this check? I know this check will always succeed, or, I, I, or I, I'm going to predict when this check will succeed, or something like this. Why do I even need to look at it anymore, right? And so what it may do is it may like do stuff like load these guys into registers or do, you know, who knows what. But point being, it may not, the compiler may not feel at all compelled to keep going out to memory to load in the, the latest value of entry count, right? Because it doesn't know that there's another thread out there that might be changing entry count while we are executing, right? So there's actually a keyword uh, in C, it's called volatile. Right, and what volatile is? Volatile is uh, a keyword that lets the compiler know that whatever the thing is that you happen to be talking about, it may be changed without the compiler's like implicit local knowledge. Right, so when the compiler looks at a piece of code and thinks it can determine that a particular thing cannot be changed because it doesn't see like a function call that could possibly affect it or something like this. Uh, volatile is your way of telling the compiler, no, no, I actually want you to assume that somebody else in the system at any time might actually be changing it. So anytime you go to use it again, I need you to actually load it back in um, and double check. So that's what that does, right? Volatile is kind of this way of saying, hey, don't, don't optimize out the actual loads of this thing every time through the loop. I need you to actually do it. It's just something you need to put in there. So the reason that I was saying that sometimes you don't actually have to do this is if we were to actually declare all of these volatile, which I'm not sure we actually want to do. But if everything here was volatile, I believe that the convention introduced in MSVC as of... I don't know, the early 2000s maybe, is that effectively there is already a write barrier around writes to volatile uh, register, uh, volatile um, variables. So I believe it actually might insert the write barrier for us in certain cases, and you wouldn't actually have to do that uh, because it already assumes that a write to a volatile is a fensible operation, right? But, unlike this guy, which we don't presumably want to put in unless we absolutely have to because it's actually an instruction, this guy we can kind of put in extras of, right? If, if we have a write barrier and there already was a write barrier there, that's not really that big of a deal uh, because we really just don't want things to move across that boundary, so saying it again doesn't really matter, right? It's not inserting an instruction, it's not a function call, it's nothing. Uh, it's just a compiler uh, uh, requirement. So that's probably fine. So, all right. So once we have this, this routine is now more correct. Now this routine, when it goes to push a string on, will actually make sure that it wrote the string uh, before it, it, uh, it incremented that counter. So that's a good thing. Uh, so now let's move down to the thread proc, which had problems in it as well, right? So the first problem that we have uh, is the fact that we did not use the interlocked operations that I was talking about before. Uh, so what that means is essentially uh, the, the exact case that I described on the blackboard yesterday where two threads could load in the value of next entry to do. They could both increment it um, separately. So they each load in like a value of one, they both increment it and each get two and then write it back out and they both end up doing work unit one uh, because they didn't know that the other person was in the middle of incrementing it at the same time. So this is where we need to use that uh, interlocked operation concept. Uh, and we can do that here uh, by do using the uh, interlocked increment function, which is actually made exactly for this thing, um, which is the simplest possible version. And all inter interlocked increment actually does is it takes the value uh, that we have there and it go goes ahead and adds one to it. Now, like I said, I think we might want to just go ahead and use interlock compare exchange for everything eventually, uh, just to keep things a little simpler. But uh, because interlock compare exchange is a little bit fancier, I want to start out with interlocked increment, just so you can see how that works, because it's very simple to understand. 
All you need to understand about it is it does a, a plus plus operation basically um, in a way that no two threads will conflict with each other. So they'll all each get back a unique value when they are, uh, when they are uh, calling interlock increment, even if they both happen to try and do it at exactly the same time. Okay, uh, so interlocked increment is really just uh, an intrinsic that tells uh, the, the uh, compiler to use uh, the correct instructions for doing the x64 locked increment behavior on the actual processor, right? Uh, and so you can see the, the function prototype right here, uh, interlocked increment, uh, what it does is it, it takes a pointer to some volatile long, right? And a long again is just an, an int32. Uh, so we, we, you know, we don't actually care about that when it's actually doing the increments. The increments will work the same either way. So we can, we can totally just cast it uh, to, to, a, to a long uh, volatile star, right? Um, <clears throat> so if we want to increment next entry to do like so, uh, that will go ahead and do that uh, interlocked increment. And then as you can see here, it returns the resulting incremented value. So actually, it doesn't quite do what we wanted it to do here. We wanted the value before you increment it. So once we interlock increment it, we're going to get back the incremented value. It's, a, it's like a, you know, it's that, not that, right? So it's actually doing this behavior, which means the in entry index we actually wanted was whatever the value was before the increment. So we need to subtract one from the value that we, to, to get the one that we actually want to use, right? So now these are interlocked. Uh, and so that gets rid of that to do. And so now no two threads will see that same value come back. So that's a good thing, right? And furthermore, we've, uh, we've gotten rid of this to do already because I stuck the volatile in there uh, to let it know that next entry to do and entry count are, can both be changing uh, without the compiler's knowledge, right? So that's good too. So finally, uh, we get into another situation, which is that this right here, right? is also a problem in terms of in terms of doing reads in order, right? Because what can happen here is we could be seeing, you know, to, to take the absolute extreme case, um, imagine if the compiler decided to do this load up here somehow, uh, which, you know, honestly, I don't really know if it should ever be able to do because if it was doing that, what if it happened to be an out of bounds load? So, uh, you know, this is not a really a real one, but I'm just pointing it out. You could get into a situation where, okay, if the compiler was being really extreme and decided to move the read up before it had actually checked entry count, right? Uh, then you could see that situation happening. That's actually not a problem here. And I also want to point out another thing, which is that interlocked increment actually serves as a fence itself. Uh, it's actually a processor fence, right? And so essentially interlocked increment will do, I believe, all of the fencing that we actually need to do. But if we really, really wanted to be absolutely sure um, that, the that the compiler was not going to do anything weird, we could put uh, this in here to make sure that like before we ever read from this, make sure everything had happened. But it really, that's probably uh, redundant. So. Okay, so now that we've cleaned up those to-dos, uh, if we run this again, let's take a look if we have if actually produced good behavior again. Uh, you can see that we've got, uh, let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's our 6, 7, 8, 9. So you can see we've fixed the problem now uh, already of the fact that this was doing uh, the wrong sort of stuff. So that's good. Let's try increasing that thread count up uh, to 8, which I guess is how many threads we'll use. Um, in the end. Uh, there we go. Uh, and you can see, let's see, 0, 1, uh, where is my 2 is all the way down there. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There we go. Uh, so, so we're getting better, right? Our queue is functioning uh, a little bit better now. But uh, let's talk about a couple other things. So first of all, uh, one thing that we want to think about here is uh, the thread count. I guess people told me, even though this this ha this pro this uh, machine has 16 co hypercores right in it, and I had cranked the thread count up to 16. Right, we made 15 threads, and then we've obviously got the one thread that's actually running here. Uh, you know, I, I'd done this, and apparently that was way too much for this machine, because uh, our 
process just hogged all of the CPU resources and OBS couldn't send out the video anymore. So, uh, we're going to have to clamp our, our thread usage at 8 here. So even after we go in and query how many processors there are, we'll probably have to put in a little debug switch that just says on this particular machine, uh, only ever use 8 because we don't want to uh, tank the streaming, which is, uh, you know, obviously a problem. So, uh, that might not be so bad later when these threads sleep as well as the other thing we can think of, but, but either or. So, if you look at now what we've got, this is essentially a, little, uh, a nice little work queue. We can actually use this work queue for basically anything that we would want to do, but it's got some pretty obvious limitations. It only sort of piles up things. It doesn't function as a circular buffer right now, uh, so that's a little bit wonky. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, it, it's not too bad. And so there's really only one thing we would have to add to this to actually use it to do the renderer because the renderer doesn't really need a circular buffer what's going to do. So if we wanted to start using this with the renderer, there's really only one thing that we'd have to do. Uh, and what that thing is, is right now, the only thing that we actually know is how many jobs have been started, right? If you think about it, next entry to do tells us how many jobs have been started. And if next entry to do equals entry count, we know that all of the jobs have been started. But what we don't know is we don't know how many of the jobs have actually finished, right? And that's a problem because if we don't know how many jobs have finished, we don't know when we can actually, like if this was the renderer, we don't know when we can actually consider the rendering done. Like we don't know when the bitmap's ready to go back and be blitted to the screen, right? So in addition to knowing how many jobs have been taken, we need to also know how many jobs have been finished. Now there's a couple of different ways we can do that. I'm gonna do the simplest one right now because for the renderer, uh, one thing that you have to understand is there's a difference between needing to know how many jobs have finished and which jobs have finished because those are actually two different things, right? If I need to know, if I need to get alerted specifically when a certain set of jobs has finished, that's a different problem from just knowing how many jobs have finished in terms of how you have to code it, right? If all I want to do is make some code that tells me uh, entry completion count, basically, like how many have been completed, all I really have to do there um, is I just have to have it so that every time one of these guys finishes, it does another one of those interlocked increments uh, on that, that value, um, the completion count, right? Entry completion count. And now I know that as soon as entry completion count actually equals entry count, all of the jobs must have been completed, right? Uh, and so what's kind of interesting about this, we can go ahead and do this, right? Uh, you saw this over here before where we had that thing where thread two was kind of off in the middle of nowhere there. Um, I don't know if we're still, uh, unfortunately that, that's not super reliable that that happens, I guess. Uh, I was hoping it kind of was. Zero, one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, I was kind of hoping that it would always do that weird bit with thread two or, or at least sometimes. There it is with uh, thread zero there, right? So. What I wanted to show here is if we wanted to make sure that we printed all these guys out before we went on to do anything else, now we actually have a way to do that, right? What we can do is we can go, oh, okay, let's actually wait until entry completion count uh, is equal uh, to the entry count, and then we would know we were done, right? So we could do while entry count um, is not equal to entry completion count, um, and we could just go, right? It's just full-on spin lock on that, right? So, now uh, we should always have this, this behavior. It should always print out our 10 uh, values and it should never actually um, do anything like allowing them you know, below the sort of load line there where we start loading things up. Uh, so yeah, so that's basically it. Now, <clears throat> I think I'm gonna go ahead and move this into the renderer. Although, well, let's, maybe we should tackle this one other thing that we're gonna need first, um, which is uh, that what we don't really want to do, uh, cause yeah, I, yeah, now I think about it, I mean, we've got two ways we can go here. We can go put this into the renderer and then we can uh, come back and talk about how to make it so that we're not burning up CPU, right? 
because all of these threads uh, are sitting here literally melting the CPU, just you know, never allowing it to go into a low power state. Now this would have been fine way back in the day when CPUs didn't have a low power state and nobody cared, uh, but nowadays you don't want all of the cores to be doing crazy stuff like this uh, when they don't need to be. And furthermore, this is a multitasking operating system, which means that if we are sitting here uh, doing all of these uh, loops, just checking this over and over again, checking, 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 never letting the processor go do something else, we are making multitasking harder for Windows, right? We are constantly looking, we're, we're appearing to the system as if we need all of this processing power, but really we didn't need any processing power. We could have been put totally to sleep and just uh, have our threads woken up again, essentially, once work actually does exist for them to do, right? So what we could talk about now, instead of going to uh, have the renderer start multi-threading itself, or I should say we should start multi-threading it. What we could talk about instead is what do we actually, how do we have to actually structure this so that when there is not work to do, and also during the times when we want to wait for work to finish, uh, we can tell the operating system that in some way that doesn't uh, totally uh, you, you know, melt, melt the CPU down uh, and make it difficult for us to actually um, coexist peacefully in a multi-threading environment, right? And this part's a little janky, unfortunately. There's really not much you can say about it other than that. But uh, the reason it's janky is because, you know, Windows and so on are not real-time operating systems. Um, they're not even soft real-time operating systems. So sometimes you have to sort of futz with it a little bit. But they do provide the, the correct primitives for doing this work. It's just you don't have any hard knowledge of how long those primitives might take to complete or things like this. So you'll see in a bit, but we'll talk about that. So what I would like to do here is I have thread procs, right? And what I would like to do with these thread procs is I would like to check to see if there is something to do in my queue. Now, I don't care what that check is. Like I said, right now, our queue is pretty remedial. That's fine. But point being, no matter how complex it does get, we will always have some piece of code that looks something like this at the head end, figuring out whether or not there is work in the queue for us to do. And the problem that we have right now is in the case where there is not work for us to do in the queue, we would like to have an else clause, which will put this thread to sleep in some way, so that the thread doesn't waste a bunch of CPU cycles. So what we need to do here is we need to figure out how to put uh, this thread to sleep, right? To do. How do I put this thread to sleep? And sleep is really a term that I'm using here. I shouldn't really say that that's, that's really not what we're talking about. Sleep is probably the wrong word. What we're talking about here is we simply want to announce to the operating system Hey, Mr. Operating System Scheduler, we are done doing work right now. You can go ahead and suspend us as a thread, and we will do something later that will let you know when it's time for us to come back to resume, right? So we need to put the, be able to put the thread to sleep here, right? And if the threads are asleep, then we need, when we do these push strings, right? we also need some way to wake them up again, right? Uh, so when we go ahead and do push string, uh, we need in here uh, some way to do Casey, some way to wake up our threads, right? So that's what we need. We effectively need some way to put threads to sleep and we need some way to wake them back up again. Now, there's some subtleties here. And the specific subtleties uh, all revolve around the fact that all of this is timing sensitive. The reason I say it is timing sensitive is because you can imagine a lot of circumstances, for example, uh, where something goes to sleep and something else is supposed to wake it up, but the thing that was supposed to wake it up happened like before the sleep happened. So the wake up doesn't wake the thing up and the thing stays asleep forever or something like this, right? Uh, so there's a bunch of, of problems that you can have 
uh, that have to do with this, right? So uh, the thing that we're going to start with here is a primitive called a semaphore. Uh, and Windows implements these. Uh, here's hopefully the correct description of them. Uh, semaphore objects. And you can read about this if you would like to read about it. I'm not going to actually read this out loud because there's a lot of text here. Uh, but essentially what a semaphore is, is a semaphore is a countable uh, weight primitive. It's basically something that in addition to allowing you to do these sort of operations I'm talking about here where I, like, I want to kind of put things to sleep and wake them up again, it keeps track of a count uh, to try and help you uh, avoid the kind of circumstances that I was just talking about where you might have a timing mismatch and accidentally leave things uh, asleep or whatever, which is what might happen if you were just using some kind of a global uh, signal or something like this, right? And I guess, I mean, I don't know, it's, I'm kind of torn on this, I'm not sure, I don't have a strong opinion about it. Like maybe I should show you how to use just a regular signal first, I don't know. Um, but point being, let's take a look at this. This was the first thing I thought of maybe to show, so I think it's just what I'm going to show. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at create semaphore. Here we have uh, create semaphore ex. Uh, and again, we've got those security attributes, which we don't happen to care about in our particular uh, circumstance, but you know, point being they're there. And what you can see is we have two counts on the sem semaphore, right? We've got an initial and a maximum, okay? And so what I'd like to do is basically set that maximum to be the maximum number of threads that could be awake, right? Uh, and I'd like the, you know, the initial count to essentially be, um, you know, the, the number that are awake at startup or something like this, right? So I want to basically set the semaphore up uh, so that it's going to be counting more or less, like, what threads do we actually have awake at any given time, right? Uh, and then what we have, uh, once we have one of these semaphores, we have a handle that comes back, a generic handle. And we can start to use that handle with a variety of these synchronization functions here uh, that Windows provides. Now, there's a lot of them, uh, and I'm kind of not going to talk about all of them uh, because, honestly, I don't even know all of them. There's bunches that have been added recently and all sorts of other things. There's our interlocked guys. These are all those interlocked guys that we were just talking about. Uh, you can see there's a ton of those as well. Uh, but what I want to uh, start with, <clears throat> first of all, uh, is just this wait for single object concept. Right? So here is wait for single object ex. What wait for single object ex does is it takes a handle like the kind we would get back with our semaphore. It takes a number of milliseconds to wait for, which can be infinite, so it can just go for forever. And then there's an alertable thing which we don't actually care about here. This is a, this is a separate, um, it's, it's additional things that don't actually come into play uh, for what we want to do. So if I go ahead and, and put this in here, right, I can show you how this works. So here is, let's suppose, suppose we have our semaphore handle here. Oops, that's a bad spelling. There's our semaphore handle, right? Uh, and our milliseconds is going to be infinite here. Uh, and I'm just going to pass false to this because I don't actually care about the alertable bit. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what's our D word? Return. Uh, so when we return, uh, we should always basically get uh, the fact that it's signaled, so we don't really care about this. Uh, so this this stuff we don't really care about. But if you let's, you might want to check this return value if you were setting a timeout here, a maximum amount of time to wait. If you were setting that, you might want to know, for example, was it the thing that I was waiting on? Did that actually trigger me, or was it the timeout that triggered me? Right, stuff like this. Anyway, ignore that for now. Point being, what this function does is exactly what we wanted the function to do, putting the thread to sleep. Right. What this does is if I call this on a thread, that returns to the operating system and says, OK, go ahead and suspend me. Suspend me for this much time. And since I'm passing the special constant infinite, it means indefinitely. Just suspend me and don't wake me up until whatever it is I passed in here as a handle triggers, right? until it gets signaled. And the reason those terms are very generic is because, as you might imagine, if you start to do lots of stuff with multi-threaded coding, especially in an operating system context, there's lots of things you might want to wait for. And so this is a generic function that can wait for lots of different things. It can wait for semaphores, but it can also wait for a bunch of other types of handles in the system. Uh, and so 
that's why it's very generic. It's like signaled, it's like whatever the object thingy is you passed me, when it does its thing that says go, that's when, right? So this wait for single object ex is just going to wait for this semaphore to be signaled. And of course, what does that mean? We haven't talked about that yet, but that's okay. Uh, this is all we really need to know for now for this routine because this gives this routine basically all it, uh, it really needed, which is something that will sit there and wait, uh, giving the time back to the operating system so other people can use it, or if there's no one to use it, it just will allow the processor to go into a lower power state and save power, save battery life, save whatever, until there's actually some signaling happening. Okay. So, we need to create this semaphore, right? Uh, so we need to create this semaphore, and like I said, we need to call uh, create semaphore uh, ex for that, right? So here's our create semaphore ex call uh, that will get us uh, our semaphore. Uh, so here's our semaphore handle, like so. We're going to create a semaphore. We don't need security attributes. Uh, <clears throat> go. One second. Uh, we don't need the help. I assume the string value here is purely optional, right? Uh, I assume we don't need to name our semaphores. I believe if you name semaphores, you can query them by name if this that makes it easier for you. But since we will always have the handle, uh, we don't actually care about any of that. So I'm pretty sure I can just pass zero here. We don't actually need a name. Um, so let's do our initial count here uh, and our maximum count. Like so. Uh, so here's our thread info. I'm going to go ahead and say that we've got a thread count here, and that's going to be the array count for thread info, like so. And I'm going to go ahead and put the thread count in there, like this. So uh, let's take a look at the flags. Uh, well, <laughs> it's reserved and must be zero. So I guess that's, uh, that's going to be zero. Uh, and then we've also got the desired access here, uh, and these uh, are just going to be, we want, uh, we want just regular semaphore access, right? All possible access rights for a semaphore object. So we want, we, we're not trying to do any sort of fancy security stuff here. We, we just want regular access. I assume that should work. It's been a while since I created one of these. So we should be able to get a semaphore handle, and then what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and snuggle that in here. Um, so that each thread uh, gets the semaphore handle from its thread info and is going to wait on it uh, there, right? Now remember, we haven't actually implemented anything with this yet, so really what will happen is these guys will all do wait for single object ex and they'll wait uh, on the semaphore handle and they'll never wake back up again. Uh, so that's not a particularly good thing, but we'll, we'll fix it. You know, don't worry, we'll fix it. We're getting there one thing at a time. So we're going to create this semaphore handle. Uh, we're going to go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the initial count is zero for now. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do it this way so you can actually see. Which there's so many zeros in this function. Uh, I feel like it's a good idea probably to, to name them there, uh, like so on. So <clears throat> here we go. We create all our threads. When we create the info struct, I will now put that uh, handle in there. So here's the semaphore handle actually getting created, right? Uh, and Oops, put unit 32 in there. Uh, and now what will happen is, well, you know, if we, if we were to run this, maybe we'll print out some strings. But uh, hopefully you can sort of, if you're starting, I don't know if you're starting to think about multi-threading stuff at all uh, or not. I know it's hard to think about. Um, believe me, everyone has trouble with it. It doesn't matter how good of the programmer they are. Multi-threading is, is intricate and complicated. So don't worry about that. But if you started to think of this through a little bit, uh, you should be able to sort of think about what will happen here. Uh, because now our threads are going to sleep, when they don't find anything in the work queue, that means that they may print out some of these strings or they may not. It entirely depends on sort of the race between whether this main thread gets to one of these pushes before the operating system actually kicks off uh, one of these guys. Um, but before the, op the operating system is going to kick off all these threads, if all of these threads make it to the wait for single object EX before we push a string, nothing will be printed, uh, but if some of them don't, uh, then you know, we may see a string printed or two, uh, but, but hopefully you can kind of see what, what's going to happen here, right? Uh, our, our, our queue will now be broken. It, it won't actually necessarily work. And so you can actually see, this is kind of fascinating, um, multi-threaded coding is always this way, right? 
So you can see what actually happened here if we reverse engineer it. Um, essentially, it, it's kind of cool because this is actually so perfect. I, I kind of lucked out. Multi-threading usually isn't so perfect, but you can kind of see exactly what happened here, right? How many threads did we create? We created eight threads, right? Uh, and so you see back in here, what's happening is this main thread can't get to start pushing the strings until it creates all of these threads. So it goes through and it creates thread zero, creates thread one, creates thread two, creates thread three. Meanwhile, those threads are starting to get kicked off. Since this thread is busy doing all this before it gets to the push strings, all those threads zero through six all come into their start routine and hit the wait before there's ever anything in the queue. But thread seven, not so. The last thread that gets created through here in this create thread, this routine manages to make it to the push string, right, before thread seven starts up. So thread seven doesn't get to here until this has already gotten to here. And by the time this guy has done its interlocked increment and its output debug string, it's had time to push the next string as well and the next string and the next string, right, this goes. And so now this guy actually is able to beat him all the way through to, to number nine. But what that means is these always print out in exact order, right? Because there's only one thread that's actually able to dequeue them. Make sense? Now we could, you know, just to underscore what's happening here, if all of these threads had to wait a little while before they were actually able to go, we'd be right back to our function in queue because none of them would go to sleep, right? They'd all have a chance to actually do work before going to sleep, right? But that's not, that's just an accidental thing. And then they would, they would go to sleep and the queue would now no longer work anymore. So we want to get this working properly, right? What we want to do now is say, okay, we've got this semaphore object. How do we actually use it to, to wake these guys up in a way that's relatively safe so that we don't introduce a bunch of bugs, like I was saying, where the push string uh, is going to be a problem there, right? Okay. So if we come uh, through here, right? Uh, oops. If we come through here and we uh, take a look at, um, uh, how we've, we've kind of gotten away from our semaphores. Where are our semaphores? Create semaphore EX, okay. Uh, so we've created our semaphore uh, and I want to actually look now, I, I always forget what they are. There's the signal, it's like there's the signal semaphore thingy. There's the signal object, where are you? There's a the thing that you actually use to signal these guys um, and I forget what the function actually is. Um, here we go. Okay. Uh, this is our function, I believe. Increases the count of the specified semaphore object by a specified amount, right? So basically what this does, this function uh, actually goes ahead and, uh, and changes whatever that count is. So whatever the count is, uh, whatever the semaphore's current count is, will go up by this amount and it will return to us whatever the previous count actually was, right? So every time we pushed a string, for example, right? If we wanted to make sure that some thread uh, would potentially wake up to process that string or something similar, uh, we could do something like that. Like we could say like release semaphore here and if the threads were asleep, uh, this would potentially wake them up, right? So we could do release semaphore, there's a caveat here. Um, all threads about to sleep, etc. Uh, so there's a caveat here, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how I probably will solve that in a second by incrementing a number by one that seems a little weird, but I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So anyway, uh, ignore that, ignore that for a moment. But so if I want to do a release semaphore here, I can, I can uh, pass that semaphore in. I, I have to actually know what it is. So I have to have uh, this semaphore here. Uh, so here's the semaphore handle. And what I can do is say, all right, I want to make sure that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this count. So I want to release at least one because, uh, you know, I wanna, I'm pushing one string on. I want to make sure at least one thread is going to be awake to process that. Uh, and I can pass in uh, the previous count, but I don't actually care what the previous count is. I just want to know that it's going to go up by one, right? Uh, so that's good. Oops. Man, I'm bad at spelling semaphore. All right. And so these all have to take the semaphore handle uh, and off we go. All right. There we go. Rawr. Okay. All right. 
And so each time we push a string on here, uh, what's actually going to happen is these, uh, these guys here are going to <coughs> <coughs> increment the semaphore. And then I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the whole point of a semaphore is what should then happen is in wait for single object EX, uh, whenever one of these guys wakes up, that will decrement the count of the semaphore, right? Uh, so basically like uh, waiting on the guy, actually, let, me, let me actually see uh, if this is actually true before I say it, uh, but I believe that, that what should happen uh, is it should increment and decrement it. Okay, let's see. Uh, do 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 do. Let's create for into the initial count. Wait thread is released because of the sum of our signal state. The count of the sum of is decreased by one. Yeah. So each time a waiting thread is released because of the semaphore signal state, the count of the semaphore is decreased by one. Right. So basically, the way these semaphores are going to work for us is anybody who's waiting on them, if they wake up, they will decrease the semaphore count by that one, uh, by one, uh, by one. It will decrement it. Right, So that provides a nice symmetry to this. Every time uh, we push a string, we're going to increment the value of the semaphore. And every time we wake up to process a string, uh, we will decrement that, right? which is exactly what we wanted to have happen. And it gets us out of the business of having to worry about signaling things in a particular order, because we now know that it's just counted. right? So it'll count how many strings happen to be pushed on there. And then it will wake up as many threads as it has uh, in order to do that as the semaphore decrements. And when it decrements down to zero, it will stop waking up threads, which is exactly what we wanted, right? Uh, but the other thing that I uh, couldn't remember is when you wait for single object, um, I can't remember whether wait for single object uh, automatically increments the count uh, or not. Um, I don't think it does, right? It shouldn't. So I don't think wait for single object does anything to the semaphore count, right? I'm just gonna assume that it doesn't for now. Uh, yeah. Let's just assume temporarily that wait for single object doesn't do anything to the semaphore count on entry. It only does it on wake up. That's what I'm expecting, but we'll double check that later. Okay. Uh, so what we need to do now, right? Uh, when we have this initial count here, uh, we don't. The reason that I'm passing in zero for the initial count is because at first we haven't pushed any strings on here, so there's no reason for these threads to get signaled. There's no reason for them uh, to wake up or anything like that, right? And so technically, what we even could do is we could do it a little bit uh, uh, differently here and actually just do it at the head end and say, okay, always decrement the semaphore. Um, but really, you know, w this should be sufficient. And we want to, if there's work in the queue, always just do it without calling the operating system. So I'm going to leave that there uh, for now, right? Now, here is the problem that I was, uh, well, you know what? I think the caveat here is actually fine. I think we're okay uh, pretty much in all cases, right? Because our semaphore is always going to go up uh, when we do our push string here. Uh, and the wait for single object EX is always going to, uh, go ahead and decrement that guy. Yeah, so I think it's fine. Now, there's a couple ways we could have used the semaphore. We can use the semaphore to actually indicate how much work is actually in the queue, right? Uh, but I don't actually want that to happen. So as far as I'm concerned, wait for semaphore is just going to be how many threads are open at this particular time. Uh, so I don't care if it ever gets above the number of thread count, right? Uh, so we're not going to try and track it specifically. We're just using it as a general mechanism to put these threads to sleep. Okay, so if I go ahead and run this now um, and go back up here, uh, what we should see hopefully is everyone's working properly. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Lovely, right? And they're all being processed on different threads and things, which is all good. Uh, but what I want to demonstrate now is the difference between doing this waiting and not doing this waiting. So let's say I do not do the waiting. Here we go and we run uh, the program, right? Uh, and what we can see now, if we take a look at performance, uh, even though we're not really doing anything with those threads at all, right? Uh, you can see that our processor load has spiked to 70% because many of the cores uh, are actually now having to do 
real work sitting there spinning on these values, loading them in and seeing that there's no work to do and then just going back and rechecking and rechecking and rechecking and rechecking. They're all locked in those loops, right? And that's not good. That is not good for battery life and it's not good for multitasking. Uh, so we really don't want to do that. It, we want to actually only use a processor when there's actual work to be done. And so with our wait for single object, um, we should be in a position uh, where we can avoid that. And so now you can see how much work we're doing is now commensurate with the work that actually has to be done, uh, which is again down sort of where the actual renderer work was happening before. Again, we can take a look at that here and you can see we're still at only 6%, uh, which is what we uh, wanted to be at in terms of if we were only using one CPU, right? Uh, so that's good. So our semaphore has worked. Uh, it did what we want to do, but let's do one more test here. Uh, which is I'm going to make another set of these guys uh, that happens basically after a long sleep so I can ensure that all of them have actually gone to sleep. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that with a sleep 5000. Then I'm going to push all these strings on here uh, just to uh, have sort of like a, a A and B set of strings, right? And just to make sure that our threads wake up again when they're supposed to wake up again, right? Uh, so here we go. So our threads go to sleep, we print out all the A's, but then our threads go to sleep. And now after uh, the timeout, when I know that the, all the threads have gone to sleep, uh, we can make sure that we print out our B's. So all of our threads woke up again, which is great. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, B0, uh, B1, B2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? Uh, so that's good. So we're getting there. We now basically have a work queue that we can actually use. It may not be the world's best work queue, uh, but we have successfully gotten it to the point where we can put work into the queue uh, and have it be retired properly uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, that, it, that is not susceptible to a bunch of immediate race conditions or anything like this, and which allows us to return time back to the operating system when we're not using it. So that to me is sufficient, I think, uh, for a start. Uh, to the multi-threading stuff. So tomorrow, I think what we can then now do is just go ahead and translate this into something uh, that can actually call the renderer, and then we'll be in good position uh, to actually start using all of those extra resources that we could be using uh, on the CPU to do our rendering. Uh, for now, though, I'd like to go to the Q and A, right? Um, <clears throat> and answer any questions. Uh, and so also while you, I'm waiting for questions, hopefully you can see why I decided to do semaphore first. Uh, semaphore is kind of a really convenient thing for work queues where you have some number of threads uh, that need to potentially wake up and do work uh, because it allows you to make sure that you don't have um, kind of the signaling inter interplay between the going to sleep and the signaling. So what you can kind of imagine is just like if I was to, to do a signal here, um, I don't necessarily want to wake up all my threads, but I want to make sure at least the number of threads wake up as there have been push strings, right? As there are things in the queue. And so the semaphore just gives me a really easy way to, to do that, right? T7 Samurai says, in the Visual Studio Debugger, you can right-click in the output window and deselect some of the stuff. You know, I'll be honest with you, I never have tried that. That's kind of handy. Huh. That is pretty darn handy. Why, thank you, D7 Samurai. That is excellent. Yeah, that's good. I like that a lot. Now we just see our program output for now. Pretty cool. Yeah. Cooper Caleb, why does this have to be so complicated? Um, well, you know, it's not that complicated. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's more error prone than complicated. I mean, there's not that much to it. Like, you kind of saw how it worked. Once you write one of these cues, you can just use the cue, mostly. And as long as you're careful about stuff, you'll be fine. Uh, so it's not, it's not that bad. Um, it only gets bad if you if you're trying to do a lot of really intricate kind of interlocking things, which you know it's best to try and avoid anyway if you can because they always got bugs in them. 
Why did you put the memory barrier in a macro when it's platform specific code? Uh, because this won't always be platform specific. Uh, these, will, uh, these are gonna have to get moved out into the render, which will be platform agnostic, actually. Um, so we, these, these will, we will have to define these per platform in a header file and use them, kind of like we'll be doing for the other intrinsics. After the sleep, some threads did push several strings, leaving out some other of the threads. Why is that? Uh, well, so one of the things you have to remember uh, is the operating system is at its leisure going to wake up threads based on a semaphore. And who gets a chance to do what with them is entirely up to how the operating system scheduler ends up deciding to, to do it, right? Um, so whoever wakes up first will process the most entries in the queue probably because it'll have them, you know, it'll have the head start and whatever. Uh, and it may be that like by the time one of the guys wakes up, there isn't anything to do, right? Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say. Would sleep zero in your spin lock help anything? Uh, which spin lock are you talking about? This one? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, essentially, so we didn't quite get to it here, but now we actually know um, we can actually do some stuff. In fact, I guess I, I should have probably, we didn't really have time today, but let's, let's uh, uh, turn uh, this into something uh, weightable, right? Um, this we won't have to spin lock on anymore, right? Uh, because now we will actually have a way of knowing what is going on. Um, because, so if you think about it, right? What do we know? We know that once uh, these guys are going to sleep, once all these guys have gone to sleep, our semaphore will be zero, right? Uh, so we should be able to, at that point, actually go ahead and know uh, or or do something creative to know uh, that nobody is is uh, we should be able to wait on that semaphore ourselves essentially in some way. Um, I'll have to think about exactly how we want to do it, but we should be able to wait on that in some way that makes it so that we don't have to spin lock on it. Uh, so yeah, so sleep putting a sleep zero in here would not be a good idea. We can do better than that, uh, and we just have to think it through. We'll we'll we'll, we'll make sure we do that tomorrow. I am GUI has been trending. Sorry if you get asked this more than you'd like to. Uh, yeah. Um, I, uh, I I don't think we'll probably do very much with I am GUI in this game, no, because there won't really be much GUI in the game. Uh, so somebody asked, when you initially started this project, what were the first five things you coded and why? The answer is, if you would like to see, go back and watch the original videos. You can see exactly what the first five things I coded were, and I will explain exactly why. Uh, as for uh, the person who said, I missed most of tonight, what does the volatile keyword mean? Uh, this will be obviously on YouTube immediately there uh, after this, and you can also watch it on the Twitch broadcast, so you can see me explain volatile. Uh, in the stream. Basically all it means is, Mr. Compiler, please do not optimize out loads of this variable. Please always do the loads because this variable may change uh, because other threads are writing to it. How do you plan to maintain cache line coherency between processors? Can physical CPUs share a cache line? Oh, well, yeah. So if you couldn't tell from yesterday's stream, I'm a bit antiquated in my knowledge of how these things work. Uh, Fabian was actually saying uh, that uh, system bus locks don't even ever happen anymore. Everything goes through MESI, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, and so that is why lock-free uh, stuff actually is sort of technically lock-free now because on x64 processors, you don't need a lock to do an interlocked increment. Kind of a tidbit thing there, but uh, 
since you brought it up and it's a very good question, I will do my best to explain what you would have to go learn to understand this part, but I cannot really explain it to you because it is not something I have ever studied or even really understand at any level beyond the very, very basics. Uh, but I will, I'll just give you the, the part that you need to know to go learn it. Uh, so, okay. So, when you say how uh, do you plan to maintain cache line coherency between processors, you're, you're sort of presupposing that I am the person who is going to do that. Uh, but that is not true. Uh, actually, the person who does that is the Intel chipset. Uh, and it is designed specifically to ensure cache line coherence between processors and cores. So the way that they do this is through a thing called uh, MESI, uh, which I believe stands for like Modified Exclusive Shared Invalid, right? So this is like an acronym. Okay, uh, and like I said, again, please take this entire explanation with a very big grain of salt. I'm just trying to tell you roughly what you should go read about. This is not something I have ever studied, and it is not something that I know how they actually do it on the chip at all. I just know that it does happen. So what essentially uh, you, you have to imagine occurring uh, is you've got on your system, let's say that I've got some beef daddy machine it's a four CPU, um, each with four cores, right? So I've got something like this going on here, right? Core zero, core one, core two, core three, core four, core five, core six, core seven, oops, seven, core eight, core nine, core 10, core 11, core 12, core 13, core 14, core 15, right? So I've got 16 cores in this processor spread across four logical processors, right? And what we know about this is that the caches, we've talked about this multiple times on Handmade Hero, the caches may be set up in a number of configurations. There may be an L3 cache, which is out here, that's shared by all the processors or that's shared uh, just by a processor. Uh, so each processor had its own L3, for example, uh, or something like this, right? But then each core may have its own uh, L0 or L1, I'm sorry, L1 or L2 or something like this, right? Um, or stuff like this. So the caches, L1, L2, and L3 are all, they can be in various different configurations depending on what the CPU architecture is, right? And as you uh, correctly sort of surmised in asking this question, since sometimes some of the caches, such as let's say the L1 cache, might be specific to this core or to this processor, how does it maintain coherence between the different processors, right? And what coherence means for those of you who don't know is if I am in executing some code in core uh, zero here that changes some memory location, and that memory location is only existing currently in this cache, right? Because let's say I've got some memory location out here, right? This is memory location 25, OX25. No, it's not, that's a ridiculous number. This is memory location uh, OX100, let's say. And it holds the value four right now. Well, if I'm going to do something in a very naive system that didn't have any of this stuff happening in it that I'm about to say, then what would happen is, I would go ahead and I would execute some code that wants to load and change this value. It would bring that value into the L1 cache of the processor here. It would then modify the value. And then sometime later it would get flushed out uh, and have the new value, like five or whatever. But once it gets brought in here, some other core might also bring it in here, change it to a different value, say six. And then what would happen again in the naive system is whichever one of these two cores happened to evict it from the cache last, that is what the value would be, right? So if this guy happened to finish last, this would get written as a six. If this guy happened to get finished last, it would get written as a five, right? Uh, and so coherency here means 
that is not good, right? We want to have some actual uh, understanding of who is writing to which memory locations and when, uh, so that when two people do a load, they know that if someone else had already written to that location in memory, when you do the load, you get the actual value. Uh, so what we want to actually see happen is this guy loads a 4, he changes it to a 5, this guy does the load, he gets the 5, is what we want. Now again, remember, this is not talking about coherency of the program, because loads into registers are not handled in any particular way for you. So that you have to worry about yourself. So once the thing gets loaded into the CPU registers, all bets are off. And that's where that interlocked increment and stuff like that come in. But in terms of cache coherency, where we just have to worry about, oh, somebody did some work on some memory, someone else later who we know is happening afterwards, right? We did some kind of synchronization to make sure he's happening afterwards. He's about to do some stuff on that memory. Making sure that he gets the values that are actually in this guy's cache and that haven't been written to memory yet, that part is the coherency part, right? Well, this is the way they do that. It's called the MESI protocol. And basically what there is, is there's a thing called a snooper. I'm not making this up. Um, they really call it snooping, right? And what happens is when somebody goes to load a value, inside each of these caches, the cache lines are marked with these flags, modified, exclusive, shared, or invalid. And what these things mean uh, is what should happen when you go to load uh, that cache line, right? So when you go to issue a load or something like this, and this uh, this core wants to actually uh, access the, the stuff that's in this particular location, right? Its cache actually knows whether or not some other part of the cache previously did a write uh, that would create a modified state on that cache line, right? Because uh, basically what happens is when somebody goes to write to a cache line, uh, I believe uh, what happens is it transitions that cache line to modify in itself and forces the other people's caches by notifying them that they have to become invalid because the value that they have in there is no longer good, right? Something like this happens. So what will happen from then on, when this guy goes to do the load, it knows that what it's got is old data so when it actually goes to do that load, it will actually snoop, quote unquote, uh, the contents of this other guy's cache and get that back instead of the value that's actually out in memory. Uh, that's the snooping part, is that it can actually snoop someone else's cache, right? Um, so the way these transitions works are actually important. If you care about learning about this, go read about it. They'll tell you it has something to do with like, okay, when two people read from the same cache line, they transition to shared. So they know that two people are looking at it. Uh, if it's in shared, then when you uh, want to go modify it, you have to do a like read for ownership to turn it into exclusive where you can then modify it because you know that no one else is modifying it. And they all transition from shared to invalid and blah, 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 right? So it's, they've worked this whole thing out that allows them to make it so that everything's coherent in here and off you go. The long and short of this is you don't have to worry about it on x64 because the x64 chipset is actually really darn good and will maintain the cache coherency entirely on its own with no help from you whatsoever. The only thing you have to make sure you do is you don't go working on things in registers thinking that you're updating them out in memory somewhere and expecting everyone can see them and then having two people overwrite the same value uh, because that the processor can't protect against at all. And that is why we have the things like interlocked increment, which are saying, oh, wait a minute, like, okay, hold on a second. Uh, that sort of read, modify, write cycle, right? That thing where we pull something into the, to the, to the register, right? We operate on it in the register, and then we put it back out to the cache, that thing, uh, we have to be responsible enough to make sure that we are never uh, doing that in a way that isn't properly interlocked. But as long as that's okay, right, uh, the cache part we never have to worry about because the x64 chip is actually really good. Was Volatile added in C99? I don't know. I don't know when Volatile uh, was added. I feel like Volatile's been in there a long time. I feel like Volatile was in there before C99.
Abner Coimbre. Wait, so transactional memory wants to simplify concurrent programming by allowing a chunk of load and store instructions to execute in <coughs> execute in atomically. Have you messed with this? I have not messed with this. I don't even know, do, are there chips right now that have it in it that aren't broken? I thought the desktop chips had it broken, so they disabled it or something like this. I don't know, but uh, yeah, okay, so Again, this is not something I've ever used. Uh, it's coming down the pipe. I don't know if it's actually in there working yet. It's definitely in there in modern processors. I just don't, it was broken in some of the chips, so they disabled it. And so I don't know which ones have it enabled or disabled. It's probably enabled and fixed by now. I have no idea. But uh, what this is, uh, there's a thing called transactional memory. And what transactional memory is, uh, is basically a way of, of doing a thing uh, they typically call lock elision. And lock elision is a fancy word for like not doing the lock. <laughs> um, so, okay, so suppose I gotta update a bunch of stuff, right? Uh, suppose I've got a whole, you know, I've got some struct, right? And it's not just one value that I can do a locked increment on and it's got all these things in it and I wanna update the whole thing, right? Well, basically what this transactional memory is is it's basically an interlocked compare exchange. Remember we talked about interlocked compare exchange? Uh, which is basically saying, okay, I want to replace the value that's at a memory location so long as the value that's in there right now is this one that I expect it to be, right? Well, transactional memory is basically like a giant one of these around a whole block of memory. Basically what it does is it says like begin transaction and I'm going to begin this transaction. I'm going to touch some cache lines, right? So I'm going to go ahead and touch this struct, right? I'm going to write all into it and just do all kinds of crazy garbage, right? Blah, blah, blah. So that's happening in here. And then at the end, I'm going to say end transaction, right? And what's going to happen is the processor is gonna to look to see whether anyone else ever took ownership of the cache lines for writing during the period where I was taking ownership of them for writing, right? And if they were, it's just going to not ever commit any of that stuff. Make sense? Um, so it's basically a way of, of doing a bunch of work as if you were single threaded and then going, hey, did anyone else touch it? If the answer is no, great, commit it. If not, then I will have to actually do some work that actually involves taking a lock so that I can actually do the work or something like this, right? Uh, so they call that eliding the lock. I don't know why. Like I said, this is not something I tend to work with. Uh, and basically what you're saying is, okay, if it just so happens that no other thread was going to do anything at this time, then I can avoid doing any sorts of locks by using the transactional memory. Um, that's, that's just how that goes. And so, yeah, I'm not the person to explain that to you. Uh, I have never used it before. I do not even know what the primitives are that they introduced into x64 for this or exactly how they work, but it's something along these lines uh, where basically because they already have all of this cache control in there and happening, uh, I guess it just made good sense for them to expose it so that you could implement transactional memory on it where you could basically say, hey, you already know whether anyone uh, did did any operations on these cache lines while I was trying to do what I wanted to do to them. So, hey, could you go ahead and just tell me if they did? And that way I don't have to do a lock if it turns out nobody did. And Abner Coimbra said, Transactional memory is often advocated as an easier to use replacement for locks that avoid any possibility of a deadlock. So I wanted your thoughts. Uh, and so, yeah, transactional memory is, you know, supposedly more uh, efficient at the limit than taking locks and stuff like that. Uh, but what, you know, what I hope to show on Handmade Hero is for a lot of the stuff that we want to do in games, you don't ever need to take a lock anyway. So, you know, uh, like a, hard, a real lock never has to be taken. Uh, and so what you want to do first and foremost is just do all your code as much as possible to never really use um, 
to never require something like transactional memory. Uh, but then if you do get into a circumstance where you find that you really need uh, transactional memory for some reason, then you know, then you do. Uh, so if you really have to, uh, if you really have to use it, uh, you can use it. Now keep in mind that transactional memory doesn't have to be, transactional memory is a concept, not a processor feature. Um, there are features in x64 which now allow you to implement transactional memory more efficiently. But you can actually implement transactional style stuff yourself by just having ways that you check to see whether other people have done things. So for example, one thing we could do that would be a transactional memory style operation is, you know, our sim regions. Our sim regions, when they go to commit their results back to the main store, could check to see if anyone else had already written uh, to some of the entities that they were going to touch, and if so, abort the simulation, right? That would be a way we could use transactional memory that has nothing to do with what's in the processor. It's simply using the concept of transactional memory. Uh, and that is something that may, we may well do. Who knows? We'll see when we get there uh, if we want to start multi-threading our simulations uh, and we find that that's something that's, that's uh, important for us to do, we could do it, right? Plain flavored, why are we building a generic work distribution system when the tiled renderer is designed to cleanly split up the work anyways? Uh, well, the answer is because, again, um, we do need some kind of a queue. Uh, like I, I, I explained this yesterday, I don't know if you caught it, um, but uh, I explained this yesterday right here. Um, basically, the tiled renderer is just designed to break up the screen into tiles. but we don't know how long each of those tiles will take to process. It could be that some of those tiles take a long time and others of the tiles take hardly any time because some of them may have like complex particle systems happening in them and other of them may have nothing but like a single tree sitting there, right? So we want to basically take all the tiles and put them into a work queue and then have our threads grab those things off the work queue so that if one thread gets unlucky and happens to grab a 10 millisecond chunk out of a uh, uh, 10 millisecond tile out of the work queue, it's not going to hold up the entire uh, rendering because we have to wait for it to finish that and then finish all of its other tiles it was supposed to do. We want all the other tiles to be handled by the other thread so that by the time that 10 millisecond chunk is done, the whole thing's done, right? So we still need a work queue, even though we've broken our things up into tiles. A work queue is important. Uh, and we don't need a super fancy work queue, so we haven't built a fancy work queue, but we need a work queue, and so we built a work queue. Uh, and that is what we will use. We seem to have run out of questions. Well, that's handy because we have also run out of time. So now would be a good time to wrap things up. There we go. Let's go ahead and close things down. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. Uh, we have been doing multi-threading this week, and now we have gotten to the point where we've more or less uh, finished uh, the basics of multi-threading in terms of how to build a work queue. And at this point, uh, really all we have left to do is actually use that work queue to call our renderer. So that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, oh, that's not entirely true. We've got one more thing we have to do tomorrow. Uh, first thing we'll do on the stream is actually to uh, show how to uh, have the main thread not have to busy wait. Uh, or maybe we won't do that first thing tomorrow because at the end of the day, um, we can have that main thread busy weight. That's not the end of the world. But we should probably do that for completeness, so we'll do that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and, and actually get it calling the renderer, uh, which will involve a couple things. Basically, it'll involve abstracting that code out into a way that we can call it uh, cross-platform in a nice way. So I'll have to do a little bit of work there. And then the other thing we'll have to do is we have to clean up a couple things in the renderer that currently don't let us uh, run multi-threaded. Uh, we hopefully will see those as actual bugs so you don't have to just take my word for it that they could happen. Uh, but, um, you know, maybe not. Maybe we'll just have to sort of fix them preemptively and say, trust me, this will be a bug. Um, so that's what we'll do tomorrow and I hope you'll all join me for that same time, same place, 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time tomorrow right here on Twitch. Uh, until then, if you would like to follow along with the source code, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with all the source code. Uh, so you can go ahead and, uh, and download it every night after we're done with it and play around with it to your heart's content. If you have questions, please ask them on our forums. They are pretty handy. 
Uh, you can also check out the annotated episode guide that members of the community have been working on that helps uh, fill up with uh, past videos and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. There's also ports to Mac and Linux and things like this up there that community members have done that might help you if you're trying to follow along on one of those platforms. If you just want to support the video series, we very much do appreciate that fact. Uh, and we have a Patreon page for that uh, if you would like to subscribe to it. We also have a tweet bot that tweets the schedule at you. So if you want to check out the schedule and keep up to date on when the stream is going to be live, that's the place to do it. And finally, we've got a little live now button. Uh, that button will tell you the countdown to the next live stream. If you are wondering uh, when it is, you can always visit handmadehero.org and see it. That's about it for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining me, and I hope to see you back here tomorrow. Until then, have fun programming, and I will see you on the internets.